Hello, good evening everyone. Welcome to our live event today. Uh, please let me know that you can hear me. Okay, so I just want to make sure that you definitely hear us, uh, hear me. Um, okay, hope everything is okay. Uh, Dr. Nadia, you can hear me, I hope. Yes, yes, Perfect. Exactly. Hello, Caroline. All right, yes. Thank you so much for confirming that for, for us as well. I am your host, uh, Caroline, and I hope you, uh, you are all well, especially that we are having uh, recently a very hard times. Uh, so, so thank you for, for being here um, with us. And, and I am glad to, uh, to have, you, uh, have you here, but also uh, Dr. Nadia is, is with us. And um, I would like to just simply remind you that uh, you can find all of our webinars on our uh, website, which is eggdonationfriends.com slash IVF dash webinars. And um, remember that this, all of those webinars, that wouldn't be possible if it wasn't for our partners. So once again, let me remind you that our partners are National, F uh, sorry, National Fertility Society, Fertility Clinics Abroad, and Donor Conception Network. And you already see uh, Dr. Nadia that is with us today. Hi. Hi. Good evening, everyone. <laughs> Hello, and uh, Dr. Nadia Caropo is from Juan Crespo uh, Clinic, which is located in Valencia, and she will explain uh, to you what causes the implantation failures and what can be done in such situations. So she will start with her presentation that will take approximately 20 to 25 minutes, and then uh, it will be time for your questions, so prepare all of your questions, you can put them all in the chat section uh, during the presentation, but of course afterwards as well. And Dr. Nadia will definitely try to help you out. Okay. And uh, again, let me remind you that this is uh, being recorded uh, and it will be available tomorrow on our side. Uh, so, uh, so if you um, need to leave, etc., or just just will have a connection issue, uh, you will definitely be able to to watch it again tomorrow. And uh, that would be it from me. I believe we are uh, ready to start, uh, Dr. Nadia. Are you ready to begin okay. with the presentation? Yes. Okay. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Caroline. So, uh, good evening, everybody. Let me introduce myself. I'm Dr. Nadia Caropo. I'm in charge of the international unit uh, in Equipo Juana Crespo in Valencia, Spain. Uh, Dr. Juana Crespo is our head in the clinic and she has an expertise of over 35 years in assisted reproduction techniques and she's one of the pioneers in what fertility respects here in Spain. And she is our inspiration because she is a very, very, uh, she, her mind is absolutely fantastic. She teaches us how to uh, understand fertility as a challenge but due to all the complex cases we receive in our clinic. And uh, every single day we learn something new from each patient. So uh, all patients are unique in our clinic. Okay, so today we are going to talk about implantation failure. Okay, as you see, there's a picture of an orchestra. Okay, and this is why. Why? Because this issue is one of the most complex ones in assisted reproductive uh, techniques, given that there are several variables which can be handled and uh, to understand where we might have, might have failed with the past uh, um, reproductive um, cycles that uh, have been done, okay? Uh, and reproductive reproduction itself is like an orchestra, okay? If something does not sound good, uh, it's because one or more instruments are failing, okay? And are not working correctly. So one instrument may be broken, another one may be out of tune, okay? But in any case, music does not sound so good, okay? And as you may see, our director is Dr. Juana Crespo, okay? And she she is, teaches us that probably, okay, she has taught us that probably implantation failure as itself it does not exist, okay, why? Because there are several problems which we do not know how to diagnose, okay, and that's one of the main issues here, okay, not all things um, 
are diagnosed. There's a lot of things in reproduction uh, that we don't know yet, okay? Uh, so that keep that in mind for the next uh, few um, slides, okay? How do we um, understand implantation failure, okay? Um, there are several definitions according to each uh, different society, the American Society of Fertility, uh, the European Society of Fertility, okay? It depends on the number of and, and quality of the embryos, okay? Some societies tell that uh, transfer, having transferred at least four good quality embryos in at least three different transfers under women being 40, under 40 years or old women is one criteria. The Spanish society just leveled that up uh, to two or three embryos, two or three good embryos, okay, uh, being blastocysts, okay, in um, different cycles belonging to own eggs or donor eggs, okay. Of course, exclusion criteria are women uh, being. Um, having other pathologies, okay, that may give uh, implantation failures, okay? Uh, so you see that according to the number of embryos transferred, if you transfer only one embryo, you have 17% of uh, implantation failure, according to Dr. Cogland, okay? And according to quality, one poor quality embryo can give you a 90% implantation failure, okay? So these criteria are very, it's, they're not strict, okay? It, depend on, it depends on, obviously, also the patient and the cycles they had before, okay? So uh, we have to personalize medicine. Why? Because we have to adapt to each patient, each criteria, each characteristics, each history. Why? Because we have to understand what is not working correctly, as you saw in the, in the second slide of the orchestra, okay? The diagnosis, the correct diagnosis, is the first step towards treatment, okay? So that means that this is not just deciding what dosage of medication I will give that to that patient, but it's just defining a plan, a strategy for that patient um, to know how I will transfer that, that embryo, in which uterus, okay, which, which preparation, the, the transfer itself, is it easy or is it uh, difficult, okay? So those things are all things that we have to keep in mind, okay, just to personalize everything for each one of you, okay? So the gold standard of reproduction, okay, um, is of course natural conception, okay? So we can see that in this first slide on your left, okay, the, the first graph on your left is based on a study uh, in uh, 1,000 postpartum women, okay, and the first group, you see that 65% of all women got pregnant, okay, in the first three months after they started searching for babies, okay. Then if you see the curve, okay, as from six months onwards, it's rather flattens itself, okay? Uh, around uh, the first year of uh, searching for babies, you can arrive up to a 90% uh, probability of, of pregnancy, okay? But in a review carried out with uh, 15,000, yes, 15,800 uh, egg donation cycles, okay? You see that 65% of those patients, okay, have a live birth, after transferring five embryos, okay? So the curves, you see that they look very similar, okay? So in all sites donation and the embryos, okay? The embryos and above all, the eggs are not related, okay? So it's not a problem of me having bad eggs or donor eggs, okay? Sometimes these curves just overlap because there are other factors that affect conception, okay? Being with own eggs or being with donated eggs, okay? So um, this gives the impression that there are uh, trends beyond embryo quality, okay, that may account for a less successful variable that which makes both natural and artificial uh, pregnancy achievement even more difficult, okay? And this here is the challenge, okay? Uh, so what there's in common, okay, being pre getting pregnant by myself at home or getting pregnant with any IVF cycle, being own eggs or donor eggs, the uterus, okay? The uterus, that it's the incubator, the most forgotten incubator, okay, that we have. So, um, more or less, 
um, the life birth rate in egg, do in egg donation, uh, it's you have an exponential increase, okay, up to five sixty-five percent when you transfer one to five uh, embryos, okay. When you just go through one to um, fifteen, between five and fifteen embryos, the curve, the live birth rate uh, ranges between sixty-five to eighty-five percent, okay. And when you transfer more than fifteen embryos, okay. Uh, 96% is the live birth rate, okay? The more embryos I, I transfer, of course, the more ch charge, uh, change, um, sorry, chances I have to get pregnant, okay? Um, uh, all the data, okay, up to now shows that um, the mean number of embryos I have to transfer to have a, a live birth rate in uh, egg donation, okay, ranges between 2.6 and 5.8 embryos, okay, per newborn, okay? And the curious thing is that the use of donor sperm, okay, even in egg donation, okay, after repeated implantation failure has not changed, okay, in uh, the live birth and did not improve live births in, in this group of patients. So that is something that also we have to keep in mind when we propose a certain type of, um, of, of of program, okay, or, or of, of, of treatment in, in patients, okay? So you see that in this in these charts, okay, you have uh, the cumulative live births, okay, how many babies are born after every, according to the number of cycles I've performed, okay? And you see that the, flat, the curves flatten in every curve, okay, being uh, donor oocytes, own oocytes, okay, be below 40 years of age, or own oocytes between 40 and 42 years of, of age. Of course, okay, you see that we have more probabilities of getting pregnant with donor eggs, okay, than with my own eggs if I'm over 40 years of age, okay. But um, the curious thing is that the more cycles you do, the curve always flattens. Okay, so this is something that also to keep in mind, and it's important. It's an important data. Okay, so implantation. It's clear that it's not a passive process. Okay, the endometrium and the embryo has have to have a crosstalk. Okay, between themselves because it seems that a good embryo. Okay. Has a, is able to change the environment inside the uterus. Okay, but However, we think that maybe even a poor embryo quality, a, a medium-made equality embryo, okay, can be able to improve, okay, their performance if the crib, okay, the earth around it, okay, meaning the uterus and the metal lining are functioning correctly, okay. So this leads us to the next graph, okay, you will see here proposed by Dr. Macklin, where you see the curve, okay? You see on your left um, the, the curve that uh, it's, uh, it rises and you have the hyperfertile fert, um, hyper uteruses, okay? These are women who whose receptivity, okay, the endometrial receptivity and the uterine receptivity is very high and they get pregnant of any type of embryo they, they, they catch, okay, being normal embryos, abnormal embryos, okay, this part of the curve, you see a lot of miscarriages, okay, why? Because they get pregnant of a lot of abnormal embryos, okay, this, this part, these types of, of, of patients are easy patients, okay, because we have just to adjust one factor that it's the embryonic factor okay but as we go ahead to the other end of the curve you see the hostile uterus these are the uteruses that nevertheless they receive a good embryo okay they fail they fail one so they will they will fail twice or, th or, or, or three times okay even these are the most um difficult cases, okay, because the receptivity is not as good and we have to select and treat patients in a very specific way, okay? Sorry. Uh, okay. Um, in a review of the literature, okay, you have, we have different criteria to uh, just um, understand which patient has 
have poor prognosis, okay, being low responders, okay, uh, women who have low quantity of oocytes or women above 40 years old, okay, this graph shows that um, in low responders, the pregnancy rates are around 15%, okay? Um, and the cumulative pregnancy rates in three cycles, okay, according to these criteria, the Bologna criteria is established by the ESHRE, okay, uh, of between lower, those are criteria to select, to place uh, women in a certain uh, box, okay, being low responders, high responders, normal responders, etc. The live birth rates are around 5 to 15 percent. Over uh, in women over 40 years old, that live birth per cycle it's diminished. Okay, it's very, very, very low. Okay, so this is just to uh, to 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 show you some data. Okay, of course, if you're a low responder, okay, uh, but you are very young, the probabilities of getting pregnant pregnant are higher because the quality of the eggs are also better quality, okay? So uh, these are data from uh, 2018 because we are uh, just uh, carrying out all the uh, statistics of last year, okay? In 2018, we have performed uh, 1,343 uh, IVF uh, cycles with own eggs. I think that this year we are around, we are around uh, one thousand five hundred. Okay, uh, five hundred six and six patients were um, performed egg donation cycles. Okay, and these are the profile of patients we have we treat in our clinics. Okay, uh, most of them, lots of them, are thirty five percent of the cycles are low responders. Okay, women who will give me less, more or less three eggs. Okay, per cycle, women with high maternal age, okay, being four, more than 40 years old, 40% 40 of our cycles, repeated IVF failures, you can see that uh, we have 80% of patients are uh, our, our patients with IVF failures and we get lots, lots of patients who come in with repeated egg donation failures and this accounts for 32% of our patients. You can see that the data is very, very important, being 4 to 15 failed embryo transfers, okay? So these are the uh, women who have been treated in lots of centers, okay, until they get to us um, to know and to have another response, okay, another feedback of what is happening to them, okay? These are the clinical uh, pregnancy rates of 2019 in our clinic, okay, with egg donation. You can see that these, uh, we have very good percentages of um, of pregnancy rates, okay, being egg donation of 73.2% and with on oocyte 57, nearly 60%. These are very good data knowing that the, 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 the profile of British patients we have, lots of them are very low responders, okay. So, uh, these are very, very good data, okay. Um, so, uh, of course, when you test the embryos, okay, there are certain um, percentage of patients who have to undergo a PGT, a fairness screening for abnormal embryos, okay, because um, they they have other problems, okay, chromosomal problems, eventually other, other things that we have to rule out for in, implantation failure, you see that the pregnancy, clinical pregnancy rates uh, increase a lot, okay, to 70.6% uh, in own oocytes and 75% with egg donation um, uh, embryos, okay. Uh, and this accounts for what we call the personalization of our medicine, okay, trying to do our best for every single patient and for the embryos themselves, okay. We usually uh, suggest and advise for PGT in women who are 42 or above, okay, um, just to um, make sure that we have good normal embryos, okay. Uh, but you must know that around 90% of our patients suffer from endometriosis, okay? So sometimes, even if PGT is indicated in them, uh, we know that their embryos belonging to endometriosic patients will suffer a lot because they are not very good embryos. And we, if we take them to a blastocyst stage and test them, eventually we can 
um, damage a lot, okay, uh, the embryo. So we have to provide those embryos the best opportunity for it, for it to implant, okay, and um, place it in a correctly treated uterus, okay, a well well conditioned uterus. If we have normal embryos, the clinical the miscarriage rate in these patients, okay, dropped to two point five percent, okay, miscarriages rates in our clinic are around 10%, uh, okay, more or less for you just to know, okay. Um, so how do we study the uterus, okay? After assessing each case uh, individually, okay, and ruling out other causes of um, implantation failures, such as thrombophilias, uh, obstructed or dilated fallopian tubes, uh, etc., okay, um, we can fo focus on, on, on a very strong point that is the study of the uterus, okay? Um, as I told you before, the uterus is the most forgotten incubator we have, okay? So we have to evaluate uh, and diagnose what is happen happening with that, that uterus, okay? Uh, we study not only its anatomy, but also its functionality, okay? So we have different types of tests to run um, that are morphological and functional tests, okay? Morphologically, we can assess the uterus uh, with 2D ultrasound, that's the normal ultrasound we do, 3D ultrasound or and pelvic MRI, okay? To rule out a lot of pathologies that maybe uh, are not easily seen, okay? And diagnosis are very subtle sometimes, okay? And the functionality are uh, assessed by using hysteroscopy in consultation room, okay, to rule out endometritis, adenomyosis, uh, doubts if there is fibrosis, okay, that sometimes leads to implantation failure. We have some subendometrial Doppler uh, ultrasound, okay, that uh, helps us to see the vascularization in the subendometrium, that it's the most important part where embryos tend to implant, okay, and some contractility tests that are made with video MRI, okay, to assess the peristalsis. The peristalsis are the contractions, the uterine contractions that we have, just to make sure that that uterus is not contracting uh, uh, in a different pattern, okay, that may be missing leading okay so um what do we have to do we have to uh, just uh, try to identify the optimal u uh, 2d ultrasound pattern um, pattern okay just to know what is not good okay and what is wrong with us okay so and on your left okay uh, you can see a perfect endometrial lining okay um in the fundical part of the uterus you just think of myself as being your uterus okay my head is the functional part and there is where em embryos attach so what we have to uh, um, assess is the fundical part of our uterus there we see uh, the characteristics of this endometrial lining in a longitudinal cut, okay, the first um, picture, and it, in a transversal cut. It's a perfect trilaminar uh, endometrium with perfect walls, okay? Um, on the other hand, we see suboptimal 2 deep uh, ultrasound patterns, okay? You just see uh, endometrial linings that are very thin. You see like black spots, okay? Here that are adenomyosis caverns, okay? You see whitish parts, okay? You you see here maybe a, um, a sickle sign, okay? Where the endometrial, uh, the myometrial walls are very thickened, okay? Uh, you, see, you see things that are not as the optimal pattern you see on your left, okay? So those things just um, makes us um, um, think that there's something wrong with the uterus, okay? And that may be the cause of our failure, okay? Um, we have to assess also for the uterine morphology, okay? This is done with 3D ultrasounds, okay? Or 4D ultrasounds, okay? On the left, you see the optimal part, uh, pattern, you see a triangular, cavity of your uterus, okay, with normal uh, measurements being three centimeters, the um, interostium uh, distance, that's the normal thing, okay, and the abnormal patterns. You have a lot of um, uh, different shapes, inner, ca uh, inner cavity shapes, okay, and this is very, a very important aspect because the shape of the uterus may change also with age, okay, an aging uterus changes throughout time, and you must 
uh, remember that the uterus is a functional and hormonal dependent muscle and that's why the changes depend on multiple factors, okay? Like, let's say, painful periods throughout your life, uh, altered menstru menstruation pattern, um, previous six sections, long labors, um, colonizations, okay, myomectomies, anything that can harm uh, even um, a DNC, a curatage, okay, for obstetric reasons or for gynecological reason, may harm the uterus and may start changing the inner shape and uh, the functionality of the muscle walls, okay? So this is very important. And some of them are acquired, okay, being acquired throughout time because of all the things that I just mentioned, or they can be congenital, okay? most of them can be repaired to restore the functionality okay but this is something that we have to take in consideration when ruling out um, uh, factors that affect implantation okay um, dr crisper for throughout time she did a lot of things and this is one thing that she's teaching us uh, together with dr fortunio okay and they have understood which type of endometrial lining is optimum, okay, and an endometrial lining that is receptive and ready for implantation, okay. The optimal pattern you see in hysteroscopy, these are hysteroscopy done in the consultation room, okay. Um, this was done thanks to a patient, okay, she was trying to get pregnant and she was diagnosed with um, endometrial cancer, okay, and every each a uh, month or two months she had to undergo a uh, hysteroscopy just to rule out that the cancer did not get back to her, okay? So there, Dr. Crespo just, um, said, okay, this is a good endometrium. It's like you see here, okay? It's pink, it's fluffy, it's smooth, okay? This is an, a, a, it, as a perfect endometrium ready to uh, ha, receive an embryo, okay? The suboptimal hysteroscopic pattern are the other, all the other uh, pictures you see, uh, pictures with endometritis, that is a chronic inflammation of uh, the endometrial lining, fibroids, okay? Asur, it was a um, um, sterilization method, okay, that created inflammation. Um, you can see also sclerosis, okay, this is fibrosis, caverns being uh, caused by adenomyosis, um, synechia, okay, because of Ash Asherman syndromes, okay, um, or isthmusilis, okay, provoked by a seed section, okay, so it can give us a lot of information, this, just to understand what is happening inside of our uterus. Is it ready? Is it not ready? Is this endometrium is going to give me a lot of problems or not, okay? It's something that we also do, okay? And pelvic MRI, very important to us, okay? We have uh, probably three principal diagnostic steps, okay? One is the ultrasound, two is the pelvic MRI, and afterwards, eventually, we, we perform hysteroscopies to understand what is happening inside the uterus, okay? So the optimal, um, wait, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I, I just passed the slide, okay? On your left, you see an optimal MRI pattern, okay? The inner whiter part being number one, it's the endometrial lining. The number two is uh, the shade you see around the endometrial lining is the interface, endometrial and myometrial interface, okay? And the rest, number three, is the myometrium, okay? It's the uterine muscle, okay? Um, this has helped us to assess the type of myometrium that we have, um, if the interface is broken or not, if we have signs of adenomyosis, myomas, okay, uh, if we have to treat or design a treatment for that uterus, okay, you see all these pelvic MRIs are of abnormal uteruses, okay? Uteruses that have been stimulated, that have been transferred, okay, and we failed continuously, okay? So we learn for, from our failures, okay? Uh, approximately 80% of our patients, okay, we find suboptimal pelvic MRIs. And the most common cause is adenomyosis, okay? Adenomyosis is a, for, is, um, a disease that affects the functionality of the muscle, okay? And it consists of little droplets of blood that has have gotten inside the thickness of the muscle and created glands where they shouldn't be glands, okay? So the, the, those glands are those white spots you see uh, in the pelvic MRIs, okay? And uh, the thickened part of the endometrial 
um, the myometrial uh, interface. Okay, so that is very important for us to assess and to know what we have to do next. Okay, but making, of course, making the diagnosis is easy, but it's not worth it if we don't, if you don't know how to treat it. Okay, um, so something that is something that we are good at. Okay, and that is something that. Um, outside outstand us from maybe a lot of, of of other professionals, okay? Because we tend to receive lots of complicated cases, and that made us learn um, thoroughly how we different strategies to treat these types of uterus. So, see, you, as you may see in this slide, you have medical. Uh, treatments and surgical treatments. Okay, we have lots of medications that we can use. Okay, and sometimes we use most of them before we get to a surgical um, treatment. Okay, and most important, the most important surgical treatment that is laparotomy. Okay, so that's the end, the the end, the only point that it's it's avoided, and it's it's used only 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 if needed and if all the other things have failed. Okay, um, so. We have different um, techniques, okay, and different pros possibilities to treat each patient. We do not use everything in each patient. This is, it will depend on what pathology uh, we see, what um, strategy we have to adopt, and of course, learning from the past failures of those patients, okay? So, um, the most important thing, okay, uh, as you may see in this next slide, okay, is for the uterus to work, okay? That's the main point, okay? The first picture so shows a perfect uh, uterus. The second picture uh, shows a perfect uh, pelvic MRI. The third picture is a perfect transfer, okay, in a perfect, perfectly prepared uterus, okay, this is the most, this is our, the, the main end point, okay, apart from getting pregnant, of course, okay, so this is one clinical case, okay, um, we have some patients that need open laparotomy, okay, to resect some nodules, okay, um, and some patients, we had a, a few patients, um, happily, okay, uh, that we needed to reset those nodules that you see in the first picture, okay, um, and the uterus were operated on, and throughout the surgery, those uterus did not bleed, okay, so those walls were as concrete walls, and as you may understand, a concrete wall is not a good place for the embryo to implant. Why? Because first of all, um, the endometrial lining cannot develop, okay, cannot expand because of all the pressure that uh, uh, wall is exerting on it, okay. So liberating that wall will make the um, uh, endometrial lining expand and grow properly, okay. Um, of course, uh, the, the, the in the most important thing is to define which type of surgery has to be done in, a, in advance, okay? It's very important for each patient who has to undergo um, these types of, of treatments to have a correct design of all the of, of the surgery itself. It, they are very difficult surgeries to be performed, okay? And um, this is another um, Mm, unfortunate case from our perspective, okay, because it's a very difficult uterus, okay. Uh, the first two pictures on your left shows the uterus after several stimulations, okay, um, and you see the white parts uh, that are uh, adenomyosis, okay, caverns. Uh, the endometrial lining is not very thick, the uterine walls are rather thick too, okay. Um, that uterus was stimulated and transferred, okay, and there was a continuous um, uh, implantation failure, okay. After that, uh, in another clinic, they decided to drain, uh, I don't know if you see the last in the second column, okay, uh, the last picture, there's a very big white roundish uh, image, okay. Um, they decided to go in with a hysteroscopy and drain some cavities, okay, of adenomyosis, and the result was a dehiscence, okay, uh, on the left um, ostium, near the left ostium, okay, 
um, sorry, the right ostium, okay, with a cirrocilia, that is a, a, a collection of liquid, okay, and the lining that was left uh, of the, 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 the tissue, the, the, the healthy tissue around that was very, very thin, okay, and this uterus, after this was already stimulated once again, transferred and of course failed, okay, so this patient came back to us, okay, uh, for a new consultation, we had to get in, repair this defect uh, with laparoscopy, treat her with different types of medication, and as you see, the uterine walls are perfect, okay? But what is our main concern in this patient? Uh, the possibility not to get pregnant, because in fact she got pregnant, but the possibility for this uterus to um, break, okay, during pregnancy. The uterine rupture is one of the complications we can have when we treat patients surgically, okay, with open laparotomy or with laparoscopy. We have to be very careful because there are uteruses that are very hard, okay, um, they're very fibrotic, uh, and this may lead to uterine ruptures, premature births, okay, and um, 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 intrauterine restraint of, of a fetal growth, okay, so that is something that we have to take in consideration and after they get pregnant just advise them uh, to do a correct follow-up in a high, um, in an obstetric unit in charge of uh, high-risk pregnancies, okay? And you, our principal advice, if you have to undergo any type of surgery, okay, is that that surgery has to be done by an experienced and trained reproductive surgeon, okay? For us, any gynecologist can do these surgeries, but only reproductive surgeons, okay, know what we want to restore, okay, just to uh, give back that uterus its functionality, okay, because sometimes if I get in and just repair it and take away a fibroid, okay, I'm not thinking that that, that woman maybe in the next but few years she would like to get pregnant, okay? And maybe I can I am damaging that uterus a lot more than if a reproductive surgeon uh, performs that type of surgery, okay? So we obviously cannot improve our results, okay? Using the same concepts that we used and techniques that we used in the past, okay? And this is the final message that I can I can send you okay that there are no secrets to success but this is the result of the preparation hard work and le learning from the failures okay uh, so this is something that we do every day thanks to our patients okay and just to squeeze our brains out to make sure that they we succeed in uh, get, uh, getting them pregnant and just um, doing what we like most, that it's our job, okay? And I want to thank you uh, for listening, okay? And I'm, I'm happy to hear about you, all the doubts that you may have, okay? And I want to thank you on behalf of, of all our clinic, Equipo Juana Crespo, for this webinar and for hearing all this uh, presentation. So thank you lots. Dr. Nadia, for your presentation, it was very informative. I'm sure you have all found it uh, useful. And uh, now, of course, it is time for our Q&A session. Okay, so prepare your questions if you don't uh, have them yet. Uh, I already see a few of those. So I will start with the very first question for today. And here it is. Hi, what should one be doing to get a healthy uterus? Okay, um, Lara, um, what should we do, okay, to get a healthy uterus, okay? There is, first of all, um, if you have sensations, okay, just painful periods, uh, just go on to your gynae and get a checkup and see that there's no endometriosis, okay, um, that there's no signs of adenomyosis, even if adenomyosis in very early, early, early stages is very, very difficult, okay, um, uh, to diagnose, okay, so sometimes uh, they are very, very, very slight um, diagnosis, okay, basically uh, conduct a healthy lifestyle, okay, um, a healthy diet, 
always um, um, help us helps us to improve that um, uterus okay especially Mediterranean diets okay have proven to be um, very very effective on that but of course if we leave ourselves just to um, the um, evolve in the future and we do not take care of what we see that it's not normal being uh, painful and, and crampy periods okay uh, it's something that maybe uh, if you get older and you want to get pregnant um, you can eventually have a uterine problem okay uh, so that is a good way to uh, just try to uh, take care of yourself okay of your uterus okay sometimes if you have endometriosis uh, getting on the pill or using a Mirena IUD okay uh, can help prevent and protect uh, the uterus okay okay thank you so much uh, Dr. Nadia for explaining this okay and for your question as well and now we do have another question uh, for you here it is I have very good uh, okay uh, thank you uh, i'm 43 no pregnancies after two find ivf with two blastocysts implanted in day five uh, what do you recommend okay thank Are you, you for your question gabriela um first of all um of course blastocysts of depending the quality that you've been uh, the quality yeah, the embryos were okay um nevertheless your oocytes uh, your ovarian reserve is very low, okay? Um, we have to rule out that those embryos were not, uh, um, were healthy, okay? So the first thing is to test embryos. Second thing is to understand in how they transferred you, if the transfer was painful, if you bled, um, what uterine preparation you had, okay? If it was a fresh embryo transfer or not, uh, how much, um, estrogens, okay, uh, were given to you, okay. Um, I don't know if maybe with 43 you will have left any good embryo, okay, because we don't have any marker to know if you will have uh, healthy eggs left in your ovaries, okay. So one thing, if you have um, blastocyst, okay, if you have good blastocyst arrival, okay, even if you have a low ovarian reserve, I consider that first of all we have to test for the, those embryos and afterwards of course is to study a little bit more your uterus and understand where the preparation failed in terms of your transfers okay um, I think that that is one of the points the most important points for you to 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 consider okay and your physician to consider okay One will be a short one. Uh, what is PTT? Julie, PTT, I'm sorry, it's technical, um, technical date, um, uh, nomination, okay? PGT is pre genetic, pre implantational genetic testing, okay? You have uh, testing for abnormal embryos, chromosomally abnormal or normal embryos, and you have molecular testing, okay, for those couples who come in and have any hereditary disease that has to be ruled out in um, in embryos, okay. The slides that I showed you are from PGT testing, pre-implantational genetic testing uh, for ab chromosomal chromosomically abnormal embryos, okay? Uh, so that's PGT. You will find it also as um, with other names, okay? But that's the, the, um, the, the term. I'm sorry, I did not explain myself. It's very technical data. Question. How many embryos do you guarantee for egg donation? Um, in our clinic, we don't believe in guaranteeing eggs, okay? Uh, because it depends on what what we need, okay? Generally, for our donations, range between ten to thirteen eggs, okay? Um, depending also on the donor, okay? Uh, and for each uh, donation, we expect to have 
two two embryos to do upper one transfer okay but usually okay in the most uh, most cases we tend to freeze from two to four embryos okay um, not counting the ones that are transferred because we tend to synchronize uh, um, receptors okay the patients with the donors just to synchronize the transfer and perform a, a fresh embryo transfer okay we do not freeze always all the embryos. Can you hear me? Okay, not sure if you can hear me. Uh, Dr. Nadia? Dr. Nadia, can you hear me? Okay, let me uh, show you the next question, but not sure if you can hear me then. What is your opinion from ERA test? Okay, um, this is a very good question. Um, ERA test, um, we do not believe a lot in ERA test, okay? Um, because we are uh, running some protocols, okay, where we see that it's not a problem of receptivity, okay, itself um, is just opening the window of implantation by ourselves, okay. Um, Eretus is not the final uh, word, okay, on implantation failure, is an instrument that can be used uh, but we know and we see a lots of, pat lots of patients that have performed Eretus Alice test, M Emma test, okay, um, that did not get pregnant even uh, w respecting the mm, number of hours uh, mm, told by the error test, if, if it, it was receptive, pre-receptive or post-receptive endometrium, okay, so uh, of course if we have that information we can use it, okay, but we ourselves in the in a clinic we do not perform it usually uh, because we see that it's not a thing of receptivity. It's opening the the window of receptivity by ourselves. Okay, especially in natural cycles, we tend to uh, use some very new protocols that we are just gathering information and we have all the data that's very 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 good data. Okay, the numbers are very good. Uh, where we tend to. Um, uh, open the window of implantations up by ourselves, okay? So uh, it's it's something that can be done. It's something that may give us information, but uh, knowing how uh, defining the uterine problem first, we can um, perfectly set, tell uh, with an ultrasound and with a consultation hysteroscopy, which endometrium will give you a correct pregnancy and which one won't, okay? So um, I'm not very fond of the error test, okay, right now. Uh, that's my that's my opinion, okay? I don't consider it a, a, a must-to-do test, okay? It's, it's not the, the principal factor, okay? All right, thank you so much. And uh, I'm not sure if Dr. Nadia can hear me, but uh, let me show you the next question. We can do it that way. Uh, I, I believe it's hysteroscopy copy before implantation, I think. Uh, yes. No, we do not perform uh, hysteroscopies um, each time, okay? A consultation hysteroscopies, we perform them when patients have failed um, lots of time, okay? Lots of times in, in other clinics or have failed any embryo transfer with us, okay? Just to rule out that there's no pathology in the endometrial lining that can justify that negative result, okay? Uh, if you mean surgical hysteroscopy, um, as I told you, 90% of our patients um, have adenomyosis, okay? That it's a n unknown, um, uterine cause of implantation uh, failure, unknown, it's not unknown, it's underdiagnosed, okay? And sometimes we need to just uh, um, take away that scar tissue uh, that it's formed inside the uterus, remodelate the cavity and try to get back the tenderness 
okay, of uh, that uh, uterus that it had in the past and restore the functionality, all sometimes with a hysteroscopy. It depends on each case, okay? It's not something that we do 100% uh, on all of our patients, okay? And consultation hysteroscopy to see the endometrial pattern, okay? Uh, we usually do it when there is a negative result, okay? Or where we suspect that the endometrial endometrium is a problem, okay? Being a chronic endometritis or an endometritis um, because of uh, altered um, flora, okay? And again, thank you so much for explaining this to us. And let me show you the next question for you. Here it is. There are some supplements that we tend to give, um, especially vitamin A and E, okay, for a short period of time. Uh, that sometimes improve not the uterus quality, but the quality of the endometrial and subendometrial areas, okay? Uh, they do not have to be administered for a long period of time. Uh, we just have administered for a short period of time uh, and depending on each case, okay? Um, so, yes, it's something that can uh be done we we give them okay we just stop them uh, if that patient gets pregnant okay or we stop them before they get pregnant if they had been treated for the timing we consider best okay so um other conceiving prep, uh, supplements uh, being folic acid vitamin b okay there are general supplements that do not improve lots the uterus quality, okay? They just are a supplement for the um, embryo, okay? But yes, there are some vitamins like A and E, as I told you before, that can, and vitamin D2, that can uh, improve a little bit the quality of your endometrial lining and the subendometrium healing, okay? The, um, with the uh, hearing each other, but that's okay. We can still do it. Here's the next part. Um, well, um, look, this is a very good question. Okay, sometimes embryos not it not do not does not depend on the day the, the 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 testing was done okay it depends also on the quality the embryo has sometimes um intermediate or low quality embryo which is normal during the thawing process okay cannot thaw sometimes it's done it does not thaw properly and even a normal embryo cannot get you pregnant okay um Agonists, uh, we use we use them. Okay, we use them a lot. Um, uh, sometimes we give agonists for three months, one month, two months, depending. Okay, the important depending on each case. Um, but yes, it may be a good strategy. But we also have to monitor. Okay, um, the estrogen levels. Um, because high, very high estrogen dosages for a long time may alter, okay, the res uterine receptivity, okay, or uterine functionality. Because as I told you before, the uterus is a um, hormonal dependent uh, uh, organ, okay. And if we suffer of adenomyosis, for example, that is a hormonal dependent uh, pathology, uh, we may be uh, just making flourish okay that uh, adenomyosis that we put at rest with the agonists okay so um yes it's a good strategy if you have if they have uh just um used other protocols i think that maybe it's a good thing to to use being uh the last embryo okay but keep that in mind that maybe a normal embryo cannot implant, but because it belongs to a 42-year-old woman and maybe the embryo quality was not top, okay? And that can alter the thawing process, okay? All right, perfect. Thank you so much for the question and again for the answer. And let me show you the next question. Yeah.
Oh, um, look, um, we transfer. <laughs> it's, a, it's a tricky question, okay? Um, the chances of getting twins, of course, with egg donation program, if you transfer two uh, embryos, the chances are high of getting twins, okay? Uh, getting pregnant of twins. But nonetheless, the most important thing is also to assess which type of patient we have in front of us, okay? Because 49-year-old patients tend to have uh, very um, high-risk pregnancies, okay? Um, because of preeclampsia, because of preterm birth, uh, gestational diabetes. And if you sum that to the fact that twin pregnancies also uh, increase those um, um, perinatal problems, okay, we do not tend to, uh, my counsel, my advice is not to transfer two embryos, it's just to transfer one embryo, okay, it's very risky and if you have good embryos being from the um, double donation, okay, being sperm and egg donors, um, I think that if the uterus is well conditioned, it's very risky to transfer two embryos, okay, my advice is just to to transfer one embryo, okay? And move on to the next one. It will be a longer one this time, so we will need to wait a minute. Got two. I'm sorry, it's a longer question. Um, I got two from the two. Only one was normal. Received treatment because I have mutations to the preparing with heparin. Okay. Went ahead with my phone. Today, my result has What should I consider? I go to IV clinic bed bound. Okay. Uh, Nayara, uh, thank you for your question. Okay. Biochemical pregnancies. Uh, talk to us about a uterine problem, not an endometrial problem. Those are embryos which stick, okay, to, endo to the endometrial lining, but are not able for some reason to carve into the, 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 the uterus, okay, an implant, okay. There are two waves of implantation. One is the first one when you get your uh, HCG test positive, and afterwards the second one is around the sixth to seventh week where the embryo just scratches more uh, deeply into the uterine muscle, okay? You are 34, you are very young, and if you have normal embryos and you do not get pregnant, okay, the problem is on another, in another part, okay, being, or one, if, I don't know if they have tested your fallopian tubes, okay, that is very important, and two, to get a good diagnosis of that uterus, okay, because normal embryos uh, have to implant, okay, um, they have an implantation right, uh, rate of 75% more or less, okay, um, so, I consider that my advice is maybe for you to get tested a pelvic MRI in luteal phase, being the phase after you ovulate, okay, uh, seeing it, okay, make it just a, a, a somebody who, a, a physician that understands um, about MR, pelvic MRI, get a, a good stan, scan and have some feedback on your uterus, okay, because I cannot believe that being 34 years, years old, you got pregnant with an I, IUI, okay, and now you have undergone three uh, IVFs, okay, with normal embryos, uh, even if you have a low quantity of eggs, you are capable of giving us good embryos, so that's a problem, okay? So I believe that the, maybe the, the problem may rely on the uterus or your fallopian tubes. I don't believe it's a, um, an endometrial problem, okay? Uh, because you're, with the IUI, you, you got, got a biochemical pregnancy, okay? So that's something that should be studied a little bit more deeply, okay? As I told you, it's better for you to do a consultation and just rule out endomet uh, uterine factors, okay? That's my advice. Thank you so much for Yet and again, uh, another question, and of course, for uh, your expertise and advice, Dr. Nadia. I know you cannot hear me, but we are like uh, 
you know, uh, via WhatsApp, we are connected. So, so don't worry, we can still do it. And let me show uh, you the next question. Um, Babet, uh, uterine fibroids or myomas can be a cause of miscarriage, okay? Because they alter the contractility. Even if there are myomas that are intramyometrial in the thickness of the muscle, uh, the more myomas we have, the less uh, receptive the uterus is, okay? And they can lead to miscarriages, okay? Uh, recent studies and in our recent Congress, um, um, our uh, Dr. Crespo went to talk. Uh, they talked about uh, myomas having to be treated, even the ones that are very, very little, okay? And, and above that, the ones that are placed near um, the subendometrium, okay, the part l just lining with the, um, the endometrium, and the ones that are intramural, okay, the ones that are subserosus, sub okay, that are like um, out, out in the outer part of the uterus, those do not account for miscarriages, okay, but it's true that lots of myomas um may be a cause of uh, of miscarriage okay so that also have to be assessed okay my advice is also to have uh, a pelvic mri um to see where the myomas are and if they have to be uh, operated on okay not just an ultrasound um um and I think that uh, if you got pregnant with egg donation and you miscarried the baby, that baby probably would have been a chromosomically normal baby, okay? So uh, it's very important to rule out uh, uterine problems, okay? That's my advice. It's very, very important for you before you undergo another egg donation or another embryo transfer if you have any embryos left, okay? And perfect. Thank you again for that. And there's another question. Oh, um, okay. So healthy embryos. How many? How many embryos do we implant? Okay. Now, uh, nowadays, we tend to implant just one. Uh, but it's true that sometimes we have very difficult uteruses that need more than one embryo to get pregnant of one, not of twins. Okay. Um, so it depends on which type of patients, which type of uterus, which treatment we did with that uterus, okay, and the quality of the embryos we have left, even if they are normal, healthy embryos, okay. So today, uh, almost all clinics tend to do a single embryo transfer of normal normal embryos, but in our in our experience. Uh, we see that there are a lot of patients who need two embryos to get pregnant of one, okay? Because they have very, very difficult uteruses, okay? So um, here in Spain, by law, you cannot uh, transfer more than three embryos, okay? When we transfer three embryos are the least, 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 least of our patients, okay? But we have to consider uh, embryo quality, uterus, okay, functionality, and uh, the difficulty we had to prepare that uterus, okay? So uh, it depends on each patient, but generally it's one or two embryos, not more than that, okay? And if two, it's not with the aim of having twins, okay? Sometimes it's only for the aim of getting pregnant of one. And once again, thank you so much for that, and uh, let's Go ahead to the next question. Um, I don't know if I understand well the question. Okay. Um, I don't know if you are asking me if that you have to wait for a certain period of time. Um, no, uh, there's no time frame. Okay. It depends on the time frame of each patient and the uh, uterine preparation that we have to do, the endometrial preparation too, okay? Uh, since we start 
the egg donation program until you get transferred, okay? We try to synchronize most of our patients, okay? So um, uh, the time frame is very, very, very slow, um, short, okay? Uh, the search for a donor is done in more or less one month, okay? Uh, and um, we, once we have the donor, we communicate it with it to the patient. And according to the preparation we will need to do, which is set up dates, okay, just to synchronize the uh, donor stimulation and the pickup with a fresh embryo transfer, okay. Uh, but you don't have to wait for two IV uh, to, for any particular timing, okay. It depends on what we have to do next uh, or the, the the strategy for you to uh, get transferred. Fantastic. Thank you so much again for the question and your help. And Dr. Nadia, so let me go ahead with the next question, a longer one again. Here it is. Oh, uh, Joanne, thank you for the question. It's a good question. Yes, there are lots of things that are being um, are being tested. Okay, right now, um, the the new thing that they are talking about is uh, the normal flora inside the uterus. What is the normal flora? What is a pathogenic flora? What will give you a correct pregnancy? Receptivity test, other biochemical markers that can uh, identify good pattern of implantation um, in endom chronic endometritis, okay, um, markers, um, proteomics, okay, uh, and it's called, um, there, are, there are lots of things, okay, that we don't know, even if they are in the research field, okay, and you maybe will have also heard, hear, heard about um, um, immunology, okay, uh, being the care receptors um, and HLAC receptors, okay, the compatibility tests that they are called, okay. Um, up to now, the societies being in the immunology, immunological field, uh, the American, the Spanish, and the uh, European societies of uh, reproductive uh, technologies uh, do not recommend to attend to immunologists because there's no consensus and no definite treatment to uh, increase implantation failure, okay? We are collecting data of all patients who went to immunologists and were set up with heparin, aspirin, corticosteroids, etc., etc., um, who got pregnant with not following those recommendations, okay? Um, we are conducting a study right now that um, makes us open another field, okay, just for the window of implantation, being um, how can we manage to open that implantation window, okay, by ourselves, regardless the timing of the ovulation. That is a new thing that is being done, okay. Uh, unfortunately, if, um, fertility and reproduction uh, is not an exact science, and even ourselves, we we, 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 we tend to do a lot of, we, we have errors, we commit, commit errors, okay? Why? Because maybe we think that some patients and couples won't get pregnant and they do get pregnant. And sometimes we just look at ourselves and tell us, tell to ourselves what we missed, okay? We, we, we thought this was impossible and they got pregnant. What did we do? And what, what did we believe before? And what did we do to get them pregnant? Okay, so um, there are lots of things that are unknown. There are lots of studies that are uh, conduct, uh, conducted right now, like, for example, also non-invasive embryo testing, okay, with not performing the biopsy, just taking the liquid um, uh, out of the culture media they are in, and assessing the proteomics, okay, and the genetic factors that can um, assess, uh, give us a correct, a normal, to see the normal results of the embryos and the proteomics of that embryo, okay, some molecules that tell us that that embryo will implant or not, okay. So there are a lot of things that are uh, now in study, but they are not 
recommended as regular treatments to our patients okay so in the future i think that we will have other things that can um help us to diminish that implantation failure okay because there's a percentage of pa patients who unfortunately will fail regardless the uterine factor endometrial factor uh, whatever okay so yes there are lots of things and and i hope we can learn more in the past few in the past next year in the following years Perfect. Thank you so much again for that explanation. And we have another uh, question, a different one this time. Yes, uh, there's a possibility to do online consultation. OK, you can um, get to know our clinic um, on the, our website. You will find our contacts. OK, and we will arrange a um, Skype visit for you. Uh, we will ask you to um, send us all the information of past um, protocols you did, IVF protocols, donor cycles, uh, blood work, etc. Uh, that can help us uh, just to study you a little bit more and comprehend what happened and what failed might have failed for you, okay? Uh, we The online consultation um, lasts for around one hour, one hour and a half. Uh, you will find myself and a nurse, okay? And we will also give you some feedback on what we will have to do next and facilitate all the things that you will have to do in your country or uh, eventually we can arrange an inpatient consultation whenever you want and arrange for those tests if you cannot are not able to do them in your country of origin we can arrange to do that in one day uh, with the hospital we work with okay because pelvic mri hysterosalpingography are not tests that we can do in our clinic blood work eventually we can do it also in our clinic uh, so we have a lots of facilities and you will be followed by one person who will follow you throughout all the process if you decide to go on and uh, do um, whatever type of treatment you have to undergo. Okay, yes, it's absolutely possible. Fantastic, thank you for that. And of course, if you would like to get in touch with the uh, clinic, you can get back to us and we will be happy to forward all your questions and requests to uh, the clinic. And uh, please remember uh, to uh, that we will be slowly finishing, but we have some questions left. So let me go to the next one. <laughs> Um, DNA sperm fragmentation. Okay. Um, there's, there are two types of DNA fragmentation. Okay. That is simple chain and double strain. Okay. The, the, the single strain, um, it's especially is ruled out. Okay. Um, there are some tests that can be done. Um, sperm fragmentation just uh, may give you uh, lower quality embryos, okay, more fragmented embryos. It's true that, that there are some papers who account that, which account that there is a, a higher risk of miscarriages, okay, with uh, abnormal uh, DNA fragmentation. But it's true that if you undergo, for example, ICSI, okay, the intracytoplasmatic uh, sperm injection, uh, the single strain DNA sp fragmentation is ruled out, okay. Um, there are other um, mechanisms, okay, to rule out DNA fragmentation, that it's like fertile chips, okay, uh, where we tend to choose um, sorry, sperms that are not fragmented, but we have, using those tests uh, means that the sperm count has to be normal, okay. Um, we do not have many main factors, and even if we have a test with DNA fragmentation with high percentages, we just treat them with um, the, 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 how did, um, oh, sorry, I have a blank, a blank spot. Um, 
despite doing the gradients we use okay to process the sperms which we are able to um, to rule out single strain uh, DNA fragmentation we do not believe more a lot on, on that just because we have had several patients where they had DNA high DNA fragmentation uh, we made IVF cycles with fertile chip for example and without fertile chips and uh, the results were exactly the same okay so uh, we are not keen on doing we have those methods of course because some patients require them okay so we we have them in our clinic but we just we have a very good lab uh, very good biologists and andrologists who are take care of those things and they are very good at choosing sperms. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much again for that. And let me go straight to the next question for you. Here it is. Uh, uh, how many myomas? Uh, basically, it's not only a problem of quantity but it's a problem of location okay um, basically the, all the fundical myomas okay the ones that are placed right here okay uh, are a big problem okay because they occupy a space uh, that um, has to be occupied by an embryo okay um, generally when we have uh, intramyometrial okay uh, and myomas and they are big enough to being two centimeters three centimeters um, we tend to uh, operate on them okay but the first thing we have to rule out is where they are placed okay so if I have a single fibroid here okay that presses onto the cavity but it's not inside the cavity we have to take it off okay being a single one if you have a whole lot of myomas of course we have to do them okay but just to restore this part the functional part the fundical part of the uterus restore the, the normality maybe we won't take away the other myomas that are around that cannot be reached okay that are in the in the lower third or uh, of the uterus okay a uterine cavity those myomas are not a problem but the ones that are a problem are the ones that are around the fundical part of the uterus okay um so it's not just a question of number it's a question of where they are located okay we have uh, another question short one this one Adenomyosis, yes, it can be diagnosed by laparoscopy. It generally gives you a very globular and big uterus, okay? But generally, adenomyosis, the first suspicion of uh, the, 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 the certainty that you have adenomyosis is a histological uh, piece, okay? That is when we do a hysterectomy, okay? We take away the uterus, the pathologist will tell us there's adenomyosis. That's not the gold standard for us because we treat patients who want to get pregnant. Okay, so um, we have very good um, means uh, to the, the to diagnose adenomyosis. Okay, with ultrasound, pelvic MRI, and eventually hysteroscopy because some adenomyotic um, ca caverns are just underlying. Uh, the, the, they are underlying underneath the, the endometrial lining and we can see them okay we see black marks okay black spots and when you open them you just see blood coming out from them or we see caves okay that are the, the it's the 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 um, scar, scarring process of uh, adenomyosis uh, but yes you can have maybe um, a, a suspicion okay of adenomyosis by laparoscopy but not all uteruses that have adenomyosis can be diagnosed by laparoscopy so that's not the gold standard mm -hmm. all right perfect thank you so much for explaining this to us as well and now it will be our last question for today i believe okay so uh, but if you have any other ones, uh, just type them in, in the chat section. And right now, here's the last question of today. Uh, 
Um, the difference at the Mm -hmm. um, the cost of which procedure, yes, of course, it's not the same to undergo an egg donation program than to have um, IVF cycles with your own eggs, okay? Um, there, is, uh, there are different budgets. Uh, they vary according to each patient, okay? Uh, of course, you can have the budgets for each procedure, okay? Um, I don't know right now, I don't have that information to provide for you, okay? Eventually, if you want to contact the clinic, we will be delighted to give you all the information you need. Um, each procedure, of course, uh, if you have to undergo um, fresh embryo transfer or you have to do a, pre a genetic testing or if you have to undergo a hysteroscopy or have different costs, okay? It's not a total cost for one thing that we propose, okay? Because not all patients need that, okay? So each each, each uh, treatment is, um, is just um, defined by what each patient needs. So that's not a problem. We don't have approximate costs. It's, it depends on what you need. But yes, you can ha have access to that information by contacting the clinic. Thank you as well for that. And I said it's the last one, but as we have one more question, let me uh, go ahead for um, here it is. Just a second. Yeah. Uh, PGD in donated embryos? Uh, mm, no. Okay. It's not the rule. Um, one, because um, we only do perform PGD in egg donation programs, okay, when the male partner has a chromosomical abnormality, okay, that needs to be tested in the embryo, okay. Um, donated embryos from other couples who undergo treatments and want to donate those embryos that are left for other couples to get pregnant, okay, some of them are tested because of that, uh, because of main factors, but generally in donated embryos, we do not test them. Why? Because uh, generally, uh, the embryos coming from egg donation programs, okay, or double donation being sperm and donor, uh, the um, age of the donor um, is the best prognostic factor of uh, healthy embryos, okay, being of if the donor is under 25, 26, below 30 years of every five, five, nor five embryos, four would be normal, okay? Of course, we have a chance of getting uh, having an abnormal embryo, but that's not the rule, okay? So they are not tested, all of them. And because if we test them, not all embryos will survive thawing, okay? And that's something that you have to, to, to know, okay? So we do not test them. At all, all of them are not tested, okay? Only the ones who apply. Mm -hmm. Perfect. And thank you so much. And as I mentioned, this is uh, our... Uh, okay, sorry. There's one more question. So let me um, show you. Here it is. As you can see, uh, sorry, not a question. But sorry about that. You're it's welcome, not, Nayara. Not. We'll, we'll <laughs> de be delighted to to see you eventually. <laughs> Fantastic. That Thank you true. a lot. And uh, sorry about this, but here's the question I was about to show you. Um, Depending on the patient, okay, if we have 42, if we are 42, day five good embryos, we usually test them, okay. Uh, it depends on the quality of the embryos, okay, and depends on the history of those patients, okay. Of course, being 42, it's uh, an indication of PGD, okay, to rule out um to rule out abnormal embryos, okay, because the chances for you to have uh, abnormal embryos is higher, okay? Uh, we need 
from out of 10 blastocysts, only one would be normal, okay, about 42 years old. So yes, it's a good thing to test them if the quality and the cohort allows us to, okay? Sometimes we just have to go ahead and give the, uh, that embryo the best chance it has in a good um, in a good uterus, well-prepared uterus and well-prepared endometrial lining. So yes, sometimes we have to take, take risks, okay? But the indication usually is to do a PGT. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Perfect. Thank you so much. And uh, I just would like to thank you. I know Dr. Nadia can, cannot hear me, but... Uh, um, yes, I'm hearing you right now, Caroline. You can hear me. Fantastic. <laughs> yes, right. right now, 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 yes. <laughs> <laughs> so it works. Okay, perfect. Yeah. Um, so in such case, you know, we will be finishing. I would like you to see that there are some thank yous to, for your uh, presentation, but also for your answers. Thank you for so much for your detailed answers. And here's another one. Thank you so much, doctor. It is so really willing to go through <laughs> IVF knowing what you are getting yourself into. Stay blessed. <laughs> you too. <laughs> Thank you very well. much. You're very kind. And we have another one. Great webinar. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, <laughs> of course. Right. Thank you all uh, for being with us tonight, Dr. Nadia, for being with us as well and for helping out and for your expertise. It is a, it, it was a pleasure for sure. <laughs> Even though we had a little bit of a obstacle, we have managed. <laughs> yes, <worked>. yes. <laughs> and, and so uh, perhaps is there anything else you would like to add? Uh, and I just want to thank all of you, uh, the assistants, and for the great, great, great questions. I hope that I have uh, answered most of them. If you have any other question, I will be pleased to answer them. Okay, just write them down, as Caroline told us, and the team is going to uh, reply. And of course, we'll be delighted to uh, to. Um, know if you want to visit us or uh, have a consultation with us online or not or presential in our clinic uh, you know that it's our home for you and we will be delighted to receive you okay and thank you very much for for this hearing me okay and giving me part of your time thanks Thank you for that. And uh, I also would like to uh, uh, just tell you a bit so you can subscribe to our uh, YouTube channel. And also in the chat section, I have just sent you a link which you can use and be updated when a new webinar is, uh, is uh, going to take place. Plus, you can already register for our next webinar on this Thursday again at 8 p.m. UK time. It will be actually a very important topic uh, because it is how can I get prepared for IVF during the quarantine? So I'm sure you have uh, many questions in regards to this specific uh, time and, uh, and topic. So, so go ahead and register. And I guess that will be it for today. Okay, I hope okay. to see you all um on thursday and again thanks so much dr nadia and Thank you all. Um, take care of yourself stay safe and have a good good evening thank you very much bye-bye everyone thank you bye bye-bye